So I would say to you as a young aspiring artist from this town to, to be inches in my mind away from somebody who had touched the fabric of things as large as the things you have was a great inspiration for the idea that maybe there was a possibility. You know, there's not, you don't look around towns like this and see endless opportunity as a writer. But you, you what, well, you've done, see, what you take for granted, you say you look around and you see this and that. Well, most people don't see that. Yeah. They, they have opportunity all around, they don't see it. And you've done, you've done more than I did, you know, and you, you're doing great things today since we're talking here off the cuff. I think when my music is still being played every single year, 50 years from now, then I'll accept that compliment, but I really appreciate that well, as far as, but I will say the, the legacy of writing, of to really, as you said, take it seriously, I think is something that is at the core of what I feel like I'm a torchbearer from your generation still taking it seriously. And um, I think that that is something that makes timeless music is when you apply your actual soul and being and as mm -hmm. you said imbue characters with with real life i did that you did yeah and uh, i don't ever remember ever saying oh what the hell and and letting something go because it wasn't worth any more time So Maury, I yeah. have so many things that I've been dying to have this opportunity. I think I sort of maybe dropped in someone's ear that I would love to sit down and have a chat with you to uh, have this to happen. So I appreciate you being willing to do it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've uh, I've looked forward to this, and I think we've uh, had intentions of getting together for some time, but we never did. I'm curious, did you play music or? Um, did you begin your musical journey as a young child or post-war? No, before. Okay. Uh, I got my first guitar, which was a, not much of an instrument. I was age 12, and uh, I had a couple of heroes, uh, namely Charlie Christian. Okay. And uh, later on, the King Cole trio, Nat Cole, when he had his trio before, he became just a singer. I wondered, uh, you, you brought up a name that really resonates with me. I think another thing that we share in common, specifically Nat King Cole Trio, and specifically the early work on television, was what got me into music. I, I have a chest tattoo with Nat King Cole lyrics on oh. my chest. That's how much <laughs> oh, I love him. Great. So the first song I ever loved, now I know he didn't write it, but was my first memory of loving music where time paused, was hearing him sing Nature Boy Oh. on um, VHS recordings of those early shows. Were you ever able to work with Nat King? Or no. What? Okay. No, I saw him though in New York. There was a bar called Hurley's uh, that was actually in the corner of NBC. Hmm. Uh, these Irishmen had refused to sell it. So they built a the Rockefeller Center around this bar. <laughs> uh, My kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> and he was such a such a gentleman and such a guy, and, mm -hmm. and so talented. A great piano player, probably, which, which has gotten lost. I, I was going to say, is it possible that he could be underrated? But his piano playing is magic. Yeah, and he didn't sing alone in the beginning. Mm. Uh, Straighten up and fly right mm -hmm. uh, was done in unison with the other two guys. Mm. The then he sang the bridge by himself, and then that thing. I never worked with him, but I did never work with a lot of people. When, yeah. when Maury Laws was sitting down to compose at that time, what was the instrument of choice for you to compose on? Well, I would never play the piano. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know uh, why. I've sat next to one for 60 years. <laughs> but, and I play what they call ranger, a ranger's piano. Okay. Uh, a, a few chords to, to figure the bass or a counterpoint, and then you write. The whole, the object in, in those days was to get away from the piano. Because okay. you didn't want to be a writer who could only write as much as he could play. Hmm. You, you, you want to write better than you would play. I can write for the piano, but my instrument was guitar. Hmm. 
Hmm. And, and I, I certainly, I always, up till now, uh, use the guitar if I'm writing a tune. I told you I was a fan of yours, so I know these little interesting factoids that I've repeated to other people, but now I get to find out if it's actually true. Oh. The elephant in the room, obviously, is what you're always asked about, which is your, you know, TV holiday classics. Yeah. Um, today, when that comes on TV, is it a fond thing, or are you literally tired of it being brought up to you and participating mm. with it? Uh, I'm fond of it. Yeah. I didn't think much about it for years, but as the, the, now they've been running, some of them 50 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, made to run twice. That was the budget. <laughs> and uh, well, it worked. They did run twice. <laughs> yeah. And, and Rudolph, which I, I must say that out here, especially Rudolph and Frosty, a lot of people think I wrote the tune. Mm -hmm. I did not. Mm -hmm. Did not write this. I wish I had. But I was. <laughs> so does your wife, by the way. <laughs> I was the. The cook and the fool. <laughs> I was a arranger, I was a musical director of those yeah. shows. The director doesn't often write the lines that everyone remembers, but you created this scenario that has become something that is, an, is a national treasure, not just in our nation, but in everywhere, which is, I wonder, is that, is that something you are able to feel, or is that still to this day feel like it's just over your head that you participated in something that my two-year-old has literally learned only weeks ago that um, how does that, what's your feelings about being a part of a legacy like that? Well, I'm pleased. Uh, a part of it is what it was. It, you know, it, there's, a, there's a team and uh, the quality of those shows is good. Mm -hmm. And certainly we were not goody two-shoes people, <laughs> but the shows don't have anything offensive in them so that they've lasted all this long. I'm, I'm, I'm also curious, are, how often are you still composing? Oh, well, not often. There's a little piece that they play at the PAC. Mm -hmm. ba, 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 ba. It lasts eight seconds. Uh, I wrote that. Years ago, one of the shows I did for Christmas was uh, The Night Before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And in it, we used that Clement Moore poem was the night before Christmas went all through the house. And at that time, it lasts about eight minutes, I scored music for it. Okay. And a few years ago, I wrote, I rewrote it out here for the symphony. Mm -hmm. And Karen narrated it. And uh, she's done it two or three times. It's such an arc of a career that you have that really this should be about a 10 part series where, <laughs> I mean, I want to know. At least. There's so much more I would love to know, but maybe we'll have more concerts. I'm also curious, one little question. Have you ever felt as a Southerner that your Southerness influenced your writing at all in a way that was recognizable to you? I think the culture with the country music, mm -hmm. which is, is, is very heartfelt and melodic, and sprang itself from folk music, maybe from, from London or England, Scotland, mm -hmm. Ireland. It's, it's not easy to write a simple song, mm -hmm. as you know better I do. than I. Uh, try not to write everything you know in the first song. You mm -hmm. know? It, 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 it's death to, to be able to have a discipline and to stay. I think maybe I got a little of that from, from the culture of the music I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Maury Laws is a country musician. <laughs> That's maybe one thing people don't know. <laughs>